good afternoon. Um, thanks very much for coming along. Uh, I'm delighted to have uh, um, Peter Hayes, the new director for the Overseas Territories, uh, come to visit Cayman Islands uh, early on in his tenure, just a few weeks into, into his job. Um, and although only a rather brief visit, uh, I think it's great that uh, we've got Peter here to join us um, so early on just to get an, a first, some first impressions of the Cayman Islands and to come and see and meet some of the people here. So I think that's great. I think without further ado, I'll ask Peter just to say a few words uh, by way of introduction about how he uh, sees this new job, and then uh, we'll be very happy to open it up for questions. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Governor, and, and uh, thank you all <coughs> for, for coming here today. I'm, I'm very pleased to have had the opportunity to come. Uh, I think it's my four, it's about four and a half weeks into the job, um, and I, uh, I'm the director in the Foreign Office in London with responsibility for the Overseas Territories. Um, and I was particularly keen to come out, or at least start the process of getting to know the territories a bit better, getting to know the people, and getting to know the issues. And I certainly would not expect, after a brief visit, to go away as an expert by any means, but to have started that process of learning and, and appreciation. Uh, and I recognize that Cayman Islands, like everywhere else in the world, uh, has real challenges, as we do in the UK, in the background of a global economic crisis, the struggle to grow our economies and improve the standards of living for our people is something we are all we're all struggling with. And and uh, and what we have, uh, which is a really uh, a helpful start for me in this role, is that we have a new white paper published just a few months ago, which sets out the relationship between the UK and the overseas territories, our ambitions for that relationship, and it sets out the vision for the territories as flourishing economies, uh, democratically robust, self-confident, self-governing, and comfortable in the relationship with the UK. And that's uh, a very ambitious agenda, and our role is to work through the governor's office and uh, and through the elected representatives and the civil service here, and indeed the people of the Cayman Islands to realise that ambition. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Any questions? Yeah, Brent. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not as familiar with the structure in the UK government as I might be. Um, Dr. Hayes, are you Colin? Shaw's replacement? Or Colin Roberts. Roberts replacement? Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry, Shaw. Uh, Colin Roberts replacement. Yes. Okay, and when was he, when was that done? <clears throat> exactly? It was about four, it was the middle of October. Okay, okay. Um, and were you with the, uh, uh, some biographical info would help, but sure. were, you, were you with FCO before or what? I was, yeah. Okay. Uh, we, I think we had earlier circulated my resume. I was okay. most recently High Commissioner um, in Sh Sri Lanka and the Maldives. Okay. Um, before that, I was what we call principal private secretary, which is sort of chief of staff to uh, previous foreign secretaries in the UK. The three, the three foreign sec the last three foreign secretaries under the Labour government. Uh, before that, I was consul general in Washington, and so yeah, I've uh, been in the foreign office for a while. Okay, um, the <laughs> the premier did not always have kind words for your predecessor. I don't know if you're aware of that situation or not, but I just uh, wonder what your thoughts might be on improving, you know, what, what's been, uh, I think the governor would agree, quite a strained relationship over the last uh, year or so. Well, I think the nature of the relationship between the UK and the overseas territories has some tensions built into it. Uh, we have, as the white paper makes very clear, we have a huge amount of shared history and tradition and ties in a very positive way. But the, as the white paper sets out, we also have shared responsibilities and shared obligations. And that is going to bring inevitably a degree of, of attention into the relationship. Our approach is, to, uh, uh, is to, to deal with this situation on the basis of professionalism, uh, to be open and transparent, and to try to build and maintain uh, a sense of trust so that you won't always agree with everything, but you can at least debate these issues in a very honest and open way uh, and, uh, and a respectful way. 
And so I think it's very, I can't speak about predecessors, but I think it's very important that we don't personalize those differences, um, that we don't uh, uh, allow emotion to, uh, to dominate uh, the debate, but to try to maintain a cool professional uh, relationship built on trust and respect to deal with what are very difficult challenges that we all face economic challenges, uh, the, uh, the very difficult reform of the ways uh, governments operate all around the world, the social impact of these things. We are seeing on our TV screens every evening all around the world the, the social uh, impact uh, that the austerity and the, and the economic challenges are having in many countries around the world. And so I think these are difficult issues and there are going to be differences of opinion, but our approach is to maintain that professional uh, and respectful uh, relationship. Um, talking of the um, relationship, obviously the, the letter recently from the minister and um, the, the, the various back and forth that's happened between the Premier and, and the UK, the relations that are not at the best. There are some issues, there are problems. Ar arriving here, do you feel that now that the UK has got a hold of the purse strings, so to speak, that things are improving. I mean, I know we, that government has a terrible cash flow crisis at the moment. It's not able to pay bills. And they may say, well, that's because you've stopped us expanding our overdraft and things yeah. like that. So what, are you, what did you see when you got here about the, the actual financial situation? Um, well, I, I think I wouldn't say it's true that we have control of the purse strings. As I say, there are um, the, the, the whole purpose of the framework for fiscal responsibility was to agree uh, with the government here um, the the sort of the boundaries, the broad conditions of what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable in terms of, of sound financial management. Uh, not, as I've said, not underestimating the challenges that all governments are facing in trying to balance the books. So, um, so we're not second-guessing every decision. We're not seeking to control every aspect of financial management. But what we have agreed with the emphasis on the word agreed with the government here, is a set of uh, a framework for financial management. And I think um, uh, our concern is that having agreed that, uh, it's really important uh, for us, but also more importantly, it's really important for the Cayman Islands to show uh, the world, potential investors, their business partners, that there is sound financial management within that framework that has been agreed. Uh, and so I think um, uh, I would portray it more as that uh, r rather than control of the purse strings. Uh, and I think, um, uh, but there is a very, uh, a very uh, full ongoing discussion about what that means in practice uh, as the day-to-day challenges present themselves, whether it's cash flow, liquidity, uh, the need to generate growth. This is precisely something which the UK and every other country is struggling with in a time of austerity when there is less money around and you're trying to reduce your expenditure. Where are you going to find the money to invest in growth? And that's a very difficult balance to strike and you have to be extremely cautious about it. Um, uh, and you have to be extremely uh, sure, you have to have checked very carefully that you've thought through whether your limited expenditure that you can afford uh, on new investments is really going to deliver the benefit and be sustainable. Tammy Suleiman, Kimon 27. Sorry for arriving late. Um, and uh, forgive me if this question has been asked already, but does the FCO plan to extend the oversight it currently has right now through the FFR in any other way? Uh, is there any other avenue that you might be looking at to make sure that we're keeping our finances in check? Uh, no, I think um, uh, the FFR and, of course, the, the relatively new constitution uh, have... Uh, revise the relationship and indeed the white paper itself sets out the relationship between the UK and the territories. We're not looking to to increase that. Uh, the, 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 the whole point of the framework for fiscal responsibility is to have an agreed set of boundary conditions uh, within which the government cooperate and, and have a lot of freedom to, to make its own decisions but within those boundaries. And so I think that's the um, uh, the whole the whole point of that is to is to strike a balance between uh, 
the local autonomy to be self-governing, but if, uh, if as long as it is within some boundaries, and that's the purpose of the FFR. I don't know if the government wants to add anything. Is that? No, no, I think I think that says it. I'm not aware of any intentions to go beyond what's in the FFR, and that's. A, um, but I think the principles that are in there are ones that we will attach importance <coughs> to. Mm. Dr. Hayes, you mentioned the, the word austerity, I think, in relation to some of the other countries around the world and so forth, but, uh, because I, we've hesitated to use austerity in relation to the FFR, but in the view of the Foreign Office, is, is the FFR an austerity measure, or mm -hmm. does it require austerity measures to be taken? No, I think the FFR is about sound management of public finances. Uh, and the, the principles underlying the FFR would be uh, relevant uh, at any time. But the fact is, in time of austerity, it is even more important that good, sound processes where you make absolutely sure you've thought through the consequences of any financial uh, decision um, uh, have been properly, properly considered. And I think that's uh, – uh, so, so the FFR is about sound public financial management an austere time is when those sound principles become even more important. To be more sp specific, given um, the Minister's comments about the cruise berthing facilities and the need for that to go out to tender, have you had given any consideration to the what is known as the Four Cayman Investment Alliance, which also involves obviously Crown land and potential taking of, of uh, revenue from, you know, public revenue into a, an investment? Do you, does the FCO have any feelings directly about that particular project that the Premier is pursuing. And my second question, which is similar, what's <coughs> your thoughts on the SPS that's just been delivered? A lot of people are saying it's extremely overly opt optimistic and doesn't actually um, have any hope of coming true. Uh, perhaps yeah, I could ask the Governor to say maybe, uh, yeah, a bit more detailed um, knowledge. Yeah, answer those. Uh, uh, I mean, in, in regards to the, um, uh, to the, the um, FFR, um, and um, the, sorry, the SPS uh, and and being ambitious. I mean, I think I think the SPS, the the, the key function of the SPS, uh, particularly in election year, is is setting out what are the broad parameters of expenditure in the next three years after this financial year, uh, and and in line with some broad policy um, priorities listed by the government. Uh, and this this uh, I mean, I think the the. Foreign Office has indicated its approval of the SPS. The Minister has written to the Premier to that effect. That is really saying that the the broad figures for expenditure and revenue are within the matrix that was agreed in August when the budget was approved, which will, uh, if delivered, will will lead um, Cameron's government back uh, so that we're no longer in breach of any of the borrowing guidelines by 2015-16, which is the ultimate the ultimate aim. Um, so, uh, so I think that's the, that's the key element that the minister and the economic advisor would have been looking at. Uh, when the time comes actually to negotiate the budget for next year, the first year of the, uh, of the SPS, I think that that is a time when uh, our economic advisor um, will want to uh, look very, very carefully at what's in there before making any uh, recommendation to the minister about whether or not he should approve the budget. So I think there's a, there's a lot of detailed work to be done then. Uh, I might just mention the Budget Delivery Committee because they they met today, I think, for the third time, uh, and they're looking at how to get better information about what's really happening um, in terms of revenue and expenditure so that we have an earlier warning of where our finances are heading. Uh, if it looks as if we're, we're going to be significantly off track, they will be putting, um, I guess they'll be putting, flagging up concerns to, to a cabinet and looking to cabinet to uh, make decisions to try to get things back on track, it should, should that be required. Uh, and I think when they're looking at the budget for next year, I suspect the Budget Delivery Committee, which uh, I think is, uh, I hope, beginning to get some traction in its new job, it's obviously a new, a new body, uh, may also have some helpful advice to offer there in terms of how credible are the, the revenue projections um, and indeed the expenditure projections in, in, in that SPS. Um, can you remind me, Wendy, the first part of your question? What was the first question again? In light of Mark Simmons' comments about the mm -hmm. Uh, I think um, uh, we see that as 
rather different. I mean, I, as governor, I certainly see that as a different. It's not it's not a procurement process as such. But I've um, uh, I, I've, I've uh, spoken to um, uh, some of the people from Dart recently, and uh, and I suggested that we will put them together with the economic advisor, so that he could have a look at some of what is proposed in the Four Command Investment Alliance to to take a view as to whether you know whether or not um, uh, 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 he feels. And again, it's a question of putting advice to the minister in the context of the framework uh, for fiscal responsibility, whether he feels. That, that is, um, you know, that the deal looks good or not. But it's not. It's not a procurement as such. It's a. What is it? I suppose it's a. It's a negotiation. Um, you're not. You're not in a competitive tendering position, uh, in terms of the overall agreement there, because you're looking at, at um, some swaps of what government has and what uh, what uh, Dart have in terms of how you uh, um, put together a, a a project there. So it's a bit different from either the port or or the airport, which which I think are projects that lend themselves to a traditional competitive tendering process. Uh, does the, either of you gentlemen, does the FFR sunset at any point? Uh, because there really isn't a, I mean, I guess 2015-16 is identified, but it doesn't really say this is when these terms will end. Uh, no, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't sunset. I mean, I think, um, uh, it, the the intention is that, uh, as one would hope, as the as the financial management um, uh, situation develops, as the as the uh, uh, the debt guidelines, you come back under the debt uh, the debt limit. Um, as hopefully as we all hope to see economic growth coming, then then well, obviously you want to make sure that the framework for fiscal responsibility is keeping pace with. The circumstances. We, we're satisfied that it is uh, appropriate for the current circumstances, but it is something which, as circumstances change, the framework uh, may change as well. So it's not something we would see as cast in stone forever, but it also doesn't have a, a natural end date. Sorry, uh, Dr. Hayes, you mentioned the austerity challenges worldwide, and, and having spent as much time as you have in the UK, uh, obviously this is a much different country in terms of how things run and how revenues are generated. Is there anything that you see here uh, specifically that the government could or should be tapping into uh, to perhaps make those challenges a little bit easier in terms of generating revenue for the country? Uh, well, as I say, on the basis of a few hours, I would I'd be <laughs> loath to, uh, uh, to be too specific. I mean, it certainly strikes me what is clear is the uh, the the beauty of the of the island, and so I think, and you know, of course, the importance of the tourism industry, uh, and so, um, and again, these are things I know uh, is not telling you anything you don't already know, but protecting the environment, protecting the natural environment, making sure that you have the systems in place to allow for economic development, but but not to the detriment of the natural environment, because that is the asset. Um, that uh, is such a key part of the selling point for the tourists is the beautiful environment, the marine environment, the, the land environment, the wildlife, and so forth. So I think um, the environmental protection, that's an area where we in the white paper have uh, increased the support that's available to the overseas territories to help them manage their natural environment more. Uh, and so even in difficult times, we recognize that as an area to put additional support into. And so that's a, a process where the territories can bid for support to help uh, with the natural environment. Um, I think the, um, uh, the the development of the port, the cruise ship terminal, I mean, we're not, just to be clear, we're not in any sense saying that, that there shouldn't be a development of the of a cruise ship terminal. Uh, we're not at all. It's not for us in any way to say whether there should or shouldn't be one. But, I mean, the importance of tourism, I saw this morning the five cruise ships sitting out in the in the in the bay there um, uh, that's um, that supporting the development of the tourist industry is clearly an important part of economic development uh, our concern is the way that if you are spending many tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars to make sure that that you're going to get value for money and you're not going to regret it if you're committing yourself to something which is going to take you decades to pay back uh, that's an awful long time to regret uh, the fact that you didn't get, get as good a deal as you could have done. And so that's that's why we're focused on the process rather than whether there should be a development. Um, financial services as well. I think there's a recognition of the uh, the importance of the financial 
uh, services that you offer here, the potential to broaden and deepen those services. Uh, and again, it comes back to the public management of public finances. Those, those, those sectors of the economy, financial services, are supremely mobile. They are the sorts of things that can switch almost overnight to somewhere else if they decide they want to. And so the importance of uh, the sound financial management, good rule of law, the transparency, the reputation of the Cayman Islands is such an important asset for you in retaining and hopefully growing the financial services. And that, again, is why we're so keen uh, to support the work to, to maintain that reputation and to preserve the, the, uh, the reputation for sound financial management because it is so important for the financial services. So I think natural environment, tourism and financial services and broadening them are, are the obvious areas. There may well be others, but just for me, a few hours here, it's clear that's somewhere to, to give some real attention to. Before we get too far away, I just wanted to stray off onto this, the FFR thing again. So, so, are you foreseeing a situation then where the the um, a, the, the attachment, or I might be using the wrong term, but the the, the FFR being added to the pub, local public management and finance law, that will stay on there. It'll just the provisions <coughs> of it will just change over time, um, or how do you okay. foresee that? Um, uh, maybe I can pick up on Peter's uh, uh, earlier answer to your question, Brent. And um, uh, there, there was some difficulty in, in terms of getting the FFR into law and ensuring that all its provisions were in the law. Uh, and the, the legal drafts people in the government uh, who, are, who know their job very well were, were seeing how they could take what was in the FFR and put it into legal language in the PMFL. Uh, but when we looked at that, it seemed there were one or two elements that were missing in there. I mean, some of the elements are are, are not legal requirements. They're, they're commentary, if you like. Uh, but because of the time constraints and the commitment that had been given to the minister that this would be dealt with at the beginning of November, uh, uh, we concluded, Inspector the Attorney General, that the simple way to do this was to attach it to the, to the PMFL as a schedule um, so that it would be in there. Um, the, the provisions in it and the principles in it, uh, I think, will remain in the law, uh, either through this attachment or at some future stage they may be incorporated into the body of a revised version of the PMFL. I, I suspect that may happen one day. There's no immediate plans to do that. Uh, the, as Peter said, that one, you know, the, 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 there's, a, there's a, a timetable to get the government finances back into a position where they meet all the borrowing guidelines by 2015, 2016. At that stage, uh, assuming we get there, then the some of the um, uh, m some of the ability of the minister in the UK to to have a say in the setting of the budget and the determination of the budget here falls away uh, because some of that fall some of that comes from the fact that we are in breach of the borrowing guidelines. So the, the one of the main aims of that FFR was to say that here is how we will get back in line with the borrowing guidelines. But the, 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 the principles of sound management of public finances that are in there and, and including on, on procurement issues, I think, uh, will stay in the law. I mean, I imagine the minister is going to wish to see those in the law, but we may well have a new procurement law. I mean, well, we will at some stage. There's a, there's a mandate for the Commission on Standards and Public Life to, to, to look at the, uh, the way in which uh, public contracts are awarded. Um, so they've done a lot of work on, on procurement. And so at some stage, I imagine we'll have a, a new law, new possibly a completely new version of the PMFL at some stage, but a new version of procurement law, which may, so what you may find, I would imagine, is that those basic principles that are in the FFR, uh, signed by the Premier and the Minister last year, might be incorporated in some other bit of the P PMFL at some stage. But uh, at the moment, I just speculate. I mean, for now, it's, it's the, the key was to get it into the law and have it visibly and obviously in the law, which is what it is at the moment. But I suspect in due course, it'd be incorporated in proper legal language into those bits of the law so that it's, it makes a bit more sense in the, in, in the context of the rest of what is in the PMFL. Just I think I'll have to be the last one. So. Okay, sorry, Mr. Or Peter or Mrs. Plain. <laughs> <laughs> you raised the issue of uh, the environmental protections, and we don't have an environmental law. And I, I read recently that the UK was pushing on that. They've, they've had some um, reviews and various things about the territories and the laws that we have. Do you have any concerns that we have been sitting on our environmental law, plus we signed the environmental charter for like over a decade ago, and we've been sitting on this law, I think, for at least eight or nine years? 
um, we don't seem to be able to move forward with it. Do you have any concerns? And uh, would the UK be prepared to push that a little bit? Yeah, I, I don't know uh, the background of, of the, the, the laws within uh, Cayman Islands, but I make the general point that this is a hugely important asset for the <coughs> Cayman Islands, and we need to make sure that it has the protections um, to, to, that, are, that are commensurate with the, the significance of the asset. So I think it is certainly worth uh, a lot of attention, both from the, the Assembly here and from, from the UK. Uh, I'm afraid we will have to rush, or oh, Peter really will miss his plane. It's a bit tight. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Last night. <laughs>